Thank you. Right. We're always hesitant to mention that I'm going to be out of town because they have this old saying, when the cat's away. And what it is, I think, is when the, cat, when the cat's away, the mice sleep in. That's what happens. Uh, but I'm going to be gone the next three Sundays. And I want to, to you to know that so that you can be praying uh, for this trip uh, as well as, of course, being here together and worship as the family of God. And we don't want a church, you know, everyone says we don't want a church that's focused just on one person, which is really important. Uh, we don't want that. But sometimes we reflect that in the fact that if the main person or this person, the guy who normally speaks, isn't there, we don't come. I think our church is mature enough to handle all that at this point, but nonetheless, years ago, I thought if I tell them, it's better for them not to know I'm gone, they won't, you know, it would be better. But I think at this point, it's better for you to know. Um, in the back, there is an itinerary of our schedule. Um, Eleven of us are going to be on the middle part of this schedule from the church, are going to be in Ireland on a pilgrimage with Russ Parker. Father Russ, you know, Church of England guy that many of you know because he's been here. Uh, but let me just mention first. Okay, so first, Susan and I fly tomorrow. Uh, we will go to London. We'll arrive in London on Tuesday, and we'll be in walking, which is W-O-K-I-N-G. And we'll be with Archbishop Sean Larkin, and he is part of uh, Anglicans like us. Not, he's not part of the Church of England, but he is an Anglican bishop, an archbishop. And he is there part of the Jesus community, which is an Anglican community uh, that is, uh, focuses on healing and the unity of the church. And I'm going to find out more about that. We're working with some charismatic Catholics in Uganda uh, who are part of the Jesus community, so we're learning more about this. And uh, so Susan and I will be in four days uh, they actually said, uh, we, I asked them on the email, I said, hey, can we plan to come and uh, go to the hotel first uh, and then come, you know, because we're going to be worn out. He said, oh, that would be great, except for uh, we have a big meeting that Tuesday night, which you won't want to miss. I'm thinking, I won't want to miss it, but I'm going to be pretty tired. Uh, if those of you know that, those flights and uh, premium economy is not bad, but I have to say, uh, I'm sure we're going to be falling asleep. But anyway, we're going to do that. And then the next morning, there's communion starting early with the Jesus. Anyway, we're going to be busy and meetings and things for uh, those days. On Sunday, uh, and again, the back, you can pick one of these up so you can pray. On Sunday, we fly to Ireland. We'll meet up with uh, a number of our people. Hopefully, when we get to the hotel at late Sunday night, they will not all be in the pub, which I'm a little concerned about. Knowing, <laughs> knowing the people that we're traveling with, I got a feeling there'll be Guinness flowing Don uh, Walker, our priest, has already assured me that's where he'll be waiting for me. He will not be picking me up, but he said he will be waiting for me in the pub um, at the hotel. We, we don't really know yet. They have one, but nonetheless. Uh, some people suspect that he left the Baptist church and became Anglican just for that very reason. We're not, <laughs> we're not sure exactly why he did or didn't. But anyway, so then we have 10 days. And, and the purpose of this trip is it's a spiritual, it's a pilgrimage. It's like a retreat. Uh, but we're going to places where, in some cases, for like 800 years, people prayed and worshipped 24 hours a day. A community did, not any individual. But over 800 years, imagine people praying and worshipping on a particular site. Most of these sites, the, like the church buildings, will be smaller than just like the red chairs on one side. They're not, and all that's there is maybe this much of stone. So you have to have someone like Russ tell you the stories. Who knows all the church history? Is, so those of you who know Russ know he knows all the stories. And so, but the thing is, God's presence is still there. Some of you know, you can go to places where people have done evil things and you can feel the evil. Uh, there are places where people have prayed and worshiped, where revivals have happened, where holy things have happened, where you go, you can feel God's presence. And so they're called, the Irish call them thin spots. And the idea is it's a thin spot between heaven and earth. And there are places like that. And uh, we've been to some of those in other places and other times in the past. And uh, so we're looking forward to uh, going uh, and spending 10 days and really asking the Lord to speak to us uh, in the pilgrimage. Uh, so uh, we're, real, we're really excited. Uh, first of all, in the worst case scenario, it rains and we eat and drink our way through Ireland. That's the worst case. That's what the worst it could be. And after the hot of Gainesville, if it rains the whole time, I'm going to be happy. I got my little light rain gear and everything, so... Uh, but, I, but we're expecting great things together, uh, and a number of us are going to be going. And, and I'm sure for those who aren't going this time, there will be many more opportunities. I think Russ does two or three a year. And this time, 11 people out of the 16 people are going to be from our church. So it would not be hard to imagine that we could, sometimes he'll do just one church. You know. So if we wanted to do it in the future, 
Uh, and he alternates. So we're going to Southwest Ireland. Next time he may do Scotland. Or there's, you know, there's all kinds of different uh, uh, itineraries you, that you can do in Great Britain. Uh, but if we have a, a level of interest, uh, he would be, you know, he's very open to the idea of doing one, you know. The only rule we have is that you can't go on pilgrimage with us, pilgrimage with us if you have a problem with drinking a Guinness. If you have a problem, you can't go with us. But other than that, uh, pretty much we can go and... Uh, this one's going to be a little tough. Twice we're going to have to get out of a float plane or a boat in the ocean at three or four feet so that we can get to shore. So if the weather, weather is bad, uh, we may miss a couple spots. But in any case, we're excited about that. Now, most of the group is returning or doing something else at August 10th is the last day of the pilgrimage. Susie and I are flying from London, well, Shannon to London, and then we're flying into Germany, and it's an undisclosed location because we're going to be there in a conference for people who are working in Muslim countries, and if it were known, they could you know, easily get bombed and those sorts of things. So people from all over the world are coming, and we're going to be there to help teach about the Holy Spirit and healing and those sorts of things, uh, as you might imagine. Um, and so we're very excited about that. So we won't be getting back until the 18th of August. Uh, we'll miss three Sundays, which is really too much. There just was no way to break up this trip. The unfortunate, in the future, I might ask Russ, can we start on a Tuesday? Because there's no way for us to leave after church on Sunday and still get there for the start of the pilgrimage. So, but we probably, uh, if we asked him nicely, uh, in the future, we could probably do it differently. But uh, so anyway, I'm missing three Sundays rather than two is the most I prefer to miss. Uh, but it is what it is in this case. So we really need your prayers, and we really uh, would appreciate so much uh, you thinking and praying for us. And again, these are available. I think Susie did some kind of cute sign that says, where in the world is Bishop Ron or something? You know, that's sort of cutesy. But uh, the main reason is not just to be curious, it's to pray, because we really do need your prayers. Uh, often, you know, like when we're in Germany, uh, we will be praying for people who are really going through it, people who have seen, a lot of these people have had friends that were killed by ISIS, other things. I mean, you're talking about some tremendous grief, trauma issues, uh, which is why, it's again, it's an undisclosed location, and uh, uh, people who are really, really living for the Lord faithfully, but with great adversity. And uh, so we need your prayer. No one is up to the task, uh, except for God uh, is uh, a God of grace and love and power. But uh, it's, it's a whole lot that we'll be walking into in terms of ministering uh, during that time. All right. Now, it's <clears throat> like David Letterman here. All right, all right, here we go. All right, so I printed out the notes this morning for uh, the main reason of that is because I wanted to read from the New Living Translation. Now, we use the New King James. There's a lot of, you could hardly get a bad Bible translation these days. They just have different sort of ways in which they try to translate for meaning versus word for word. Uh, and, you know, I'll give you a lecture sometime on why that's important. Uh, there are, it's important at times to really understand what's being meant, uh, like the New Living Translation, like this morning, and there are times in which it's very helpful uh, which you study word for word. And, and so the, the, every translation, basically, on the scale of literal word for word versus meaning, all the translations are somewhere in that line. And they're all useful uh, because... You know, sometimes word for word uh, doesn't make sense. Imagine if a hundred years from now, uh, I said in a sermon that uh, I was a knucklehead. Imagine taking a dictionary, not knowing what knucklehead means, and looking that up and saying, knuckle and head. He's a knucklehead, so he thinks he has a deformed head. Meaning 80% of language is idiomatic, meaning that you can't just go to a dictionary, that the, the context of what is being said. So a lot of translations brag, oh, we're word for word. We're, well, yes, but sometimes being word for word can actually hide the meaning instead of reveal the meaning. So you have to have both. On the other hand, you don't want just to only have for meaning, because if you don't keep close to the words, how do you know for sure you kept the meaning? So there's, there's, that's why you have to have many Bible translations, and that's why some people still learn Greek and Hebrew and all that to keep us on track but in general, I really recommend, I love the New Living Translation. If you, uh, my nephew was asking me the other day, what, what Bible do you recommend? I said, well, I said, here on my, right next to me for my devotions is the New Living Translation. That tells you something. Uh, but I preach out of the New King James. But today, the New Living. So here's chapter four of 1 Samuel. Let me remind you uh, that Samuel was born as a miracle baby. Uh, let me remind you that his mother 
uh, it was in her prayer and her grief and her anger that she brought to God that God heard her and through Eli, the high priest, blessed her and she conceived a child. But the deal was, she said, if you'll do this great thing and give me a child, she said, I will lend him back to you all of his days. Because every child we're a steward of, we don't control own. And I mentioned this, but it's important to say, the only two religions in the ancient world who believed that you did not have absolute right of life and death over a child was Judaism and then Christianity. Meaning every other ancient culture believed that a parent had the right to kill their child at their whim. Okay, that's how, uh, that's how the Greeks, the Romans, you go back, they all believed that. But it was only Jews and Christians who believed that children are a gift from God and that we are stewards of them and that we're there to help them to grow and to be and to follow God for themselves, but that we don't have the right as parent over them until they reach maturity. Uh, so that's an important thing. So, so she says this beautiful thing that reflects that. If you'll lend them to me and give them to me, I'll lend them back to you all of his days. So Samuel goes, he grows up in the temple, probably weaned between three and five which some of us today might think that sounds pretty excessive, but in the ancient world, the Jews would wean their children to breastfeed them until between three and five, and then uh, he was released to the temple and he served the temple and grew up there. So for the next uh, seven, eight to 20 years, uh, the Holy Spirit began to come on him and started to speak to him, and we've looked at that and, and et cetera. But there was a problem. He was working for Eli, the high priest, who himself was not a wicked person, but he had grown sons who worked in the temple, who were priests, who were raping the virgins who worked at the temple and also were corrupt and were stealing the sacrifices and made a mockery, did not believe in God, were not living right with God, and yet were in the institutional power of the temple. And Eli had, listen, when our kids grow up, we don't have control over them. You're not responsible for the things you can't control. Okay, That's part of dysfunction is to think you're responsible on things you can't have no authority to fix. You're not. The difference here is the adult children of Eli worked for Eli, and he did have control. He had the power and the control to stop them and to fix the problem, and over 40 years, he didn't do so. And God took it very personally. It was very personally, and it brought destruction all the way into the people of Israel uh, during those 40 years, and the whole nation drifted profoundly from God. So uh, that happens now we get to the point where it's all falling apart, the rug is being pulled out, and we're seeing the destruction uh, that's going to come uh, in this chapter. So the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Samuel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. Now, turn your page over, and you'll notice the map, which is really not that helpful. <laughs> but I'm going to help you with it a little bit. If you see, I went in and drew those circles and put the question mark, all right, to help you with the map. So if you go in there, you'll see the salt sea, of course, is the Dead Sea. I don't know why this particular thing calls it the salt sea, but I mean, it's full of salts and minerals, but nonetheless, that's the Dead Sea. The circle that's right by there, the kind of in the middle, that's Jerusalem. All right, now Jerusalem is in hills and mountains. So you go down, there's a real mountainy area to go down into flat plains by the time you get to the Jordan and the Salt Sea. Now, when you see Moab and Amnon, that is modern-day Jordan. When you get up to Gilead, that's where Syria is, and you get on the left of Gilead on your map, or west, that's where Lebanon is. Down in the bottom, Negev, of course, that's where you're going to get into Egypt, and to the east, of course, would be Saudi Arabia. Okay? Now, I'm not great with geography, but I've been there, so it's, if I've been someplace, it helps me. Uh, Susie does all the map quest stuff for us, though, anyway, as a confession. So here we go. So here's Jerusalem. When you go up there, you see Shiloh. Shiloh is where the tabernacle had been. All right, and in this story, the tabernacle is in Shiloh. They're going to move it. Now, Aphek, or whatever, not Aphek, what is the name of that city? Aphek, uh, Aphek. That city is on the coast, and it's the circle all the way to the left or to the uh, west. That's Aphek. And then the question mark is roughly around where Ebenezer is. All right, the marker remembers this place, this town of remembrance. All right, that is Ebenezer. That is right there with the question around, maybe a little bit further left or to the west, but right about in there is where that town is. All right, now remember the Philistines had five cities on the coast, and those dots, if you look on the left, 
mention at least three of those cities. What the Philistines did that other people didn't do are twofold. Number one, they were from the Aegeans. They were Greeks. They had advancements in military war. They had better armor. They, had, they used iron instead of bronze. Uh, and they had uh, Greek technology. And they also had chariots that they had from the Greeks that were better. So their superiority was on all the flat and the plain. But as you can imagine, in hills and mountains, chariots are not nearly as valuable. So the Israelites, the Jews, they were able to still retain uh, superiority in the hills and mountains, uh, but the Philistines were dominating for, uh, you know, 600 years or something like that, a long time, maybe more, uh, in the coastal cities. But they also had, they had five cities, five major cities, and for each city they had a king or a leader of that city. But the key thing was they were a confederacy, I mean they worked together in unity. This is something that because they did that, they were able to uh, work together in a very strong way uh, and be uh, a powerful antagonist to the Israelites, uh, again, for, for uh, many, many years, through the life of uh, the judges all the way, all the way until David uh, uh, deals with that with Goliath, and that becomes the real beginning of the end for them. All right, so if you see those arrows, that gets ahead of us for a couple of weeks, but what the point of those arrows are is that the, t- the tabernacle, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, is going to move from Shiloh over to Aphek, and then the weeks that follow when I get back, we're going to trace what happens when it's stolen all the way down to some other cities and then how it ended up being in Jerusalem. We're going, to, we're going to trace that in the book of 1 Samuel. But for today's purposes, it's just that circle where Shiloh is, the tabernacle going over to Aphek, and then the question mark is where the battle is that the Israelites lost. Anyway, I thought it might be helpful to have some idea uh, what we're talking about uh, in terms of the geography. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Next week, when Alvis is here, we'll learn. The next time I'm here, I'll try to be able to click it up there and enlarge it so you can see it better. I didn't realize until it printed that very few of us are going to read that. Certainly not me. Okay. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. This is, the word in Hebrew is really for a unit, like battalion, which It could be 1,000, but it could be 800. It could be 750. It's a a size of a unit of military. Uh, It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly 1,000. That's not what it's said in the original text. Three, after the battle was over, the troops retreated, retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Now, there is a footnote there, and if you go to the bottom of your page, you will notice that in Judges, God had promised all the land to the Israelites, and they were able to take it temporarily, and they were able to know that God would be with them so they could exercise control. So when that no longer was possible, when they fought the Philistines and lost, they knew the old people remembered. They had historical memory. When this happens, it's not just because the Philistines have great chariots and all that other stuff. It's because we're not following God. Now, isn't that interesting? Because we're living in a civilization, and all, civilization all the world that are falling apart in all kinds of ways. Maybe they always have. But isn't it funny that people are always looking for solutions that cannot work? We cannot impose government solutions on people to make it work. Government can be incredibly effective. You know, in revivals, when the Holy Spirit moves and changes the hearts of a people, it's amazing how intelligent and wise a government becomes. Because when people change on the inside, the, the program, all this stuff works. But without that, it doesn't work. And some people have memories. Some people, historians, the people remember. Oh, remember how bad it was before the first great awakening. Remember what it was with Wesley. Remember what it was. Remember the, the ones that happened uh, down in, uh, in Argentina. Remember the, look what happened. We're losing in all kinds of ways. The church has become impotent. And there's people who think, oh, it's about music, it's about this or that. The reason is the hearts of God's people are not with God. Not wholly with God. We are looking to God to be our rescuer, our savior. Man, a business deal, our finances, man, all of a sudden we get holy when it comes down to money. We're physically ill, of course, we turn to God, why wouldn't we? We're students, I can remember praying, Lord, help me with chemistry. I can remember getting down on my knees. 
I don't know that I ever did before, but my grandfather, when he prayed, he would get on his knees. I remember being in Southern California. I was in Mission Viejo High School. Hate to say the mascot was Diablo. Sorry, I was a Mission Viejo Diablo, which is devil. Sorry. That explains a lot, doesn't it? But anyway, so I remember getting on my knees and praying night after night, Lord, you can open up my mind and help me understand chemistry because my mind does not get it. And I had read an article saying that in abstract things like algebra and different chemistry, that there was partly the development of the chemistry in your brain that allowed you to understand that stuff easier or harder based upon how your brain chemistry was. When I heard that, I said, well, Lord, you can fix that in my, you can open up my brain to understand abstractions and these things that I don't understand, and he did. Now, I cannot say that I kept any of the knowledge, but I did get an A in chemistry, which is, to me, just hilarious. Because the only thing I remember about chemistry is I think AU is gold. That's about it. I got a couple other things. I know what water is, H2O, right? But that's about it. And it was not a, it was a IB type thing. I mean, I don't know how I got through, but I did pray and I asked God. And I also studied nothing, but, but I knew I needed help from God. There is nothing wrong that in our sickness or in our finances or in our challenges at work, there's nothing wrong turning to God. But what's wrong is if we turn to God to help us out of the trouble without an intention to live for God in his presence. See, to want his power without wanting to want him to be Savior without being Lord, that is inappropriate. Because what the Lord requires is a people that would seek him and follow him with all of their heart. Now, we do that imperfectly. That's why we repent all the time. Well, I mean, we can't do it very easily. It's very hard. So that's why we're seeking and we're praying or reading God's word. We're forgiving people. We're forgiving ourselves. Uh, we're taking communion. We're, we're, we're learning the Bible, meaning it takes a whole lot for us to present ourselves from duty so the Holy Spirit can get a hold of us and help us to be the kind of people that would please God. It doesn't happen by accident, and it doesn't happen haphazardly. It happens with people who begin to get a hunger, thirst, for, to live like Jesus and to follow him and to please him, and then we begin to apply ourselves, and then grace meets us. We step out in faith and obedience. We read the Bible. Listen, there's people who read the Bible and never change. There's people who ask the Holy Spirit to meet them, and they read the Bible, and their lives change radically. But the Bible alone, apart from the Spirit, won't change anybody. I don't know if you know that. The beautiful thing is, rarely is the Bible led without the Spirit trying to work at least. And yet some people starts. I will tell you though, you know, I got a PhD in theology. I've done a lot of Bible reading. Sadly, a lot of that when I was a young man was for pride. It was not led by the Spirit. I wanted to know more than the next person. I spent years and hours and hours reading and studying so that I could be the guy who won the debate, not because I wanted to be like Jesus. And I'll be even more sad to tell you, I really didn't know the difference. That's how sad it was. I didn't know. I thought winning the debate was what it meant to be a good Christian. And I'll tell you, winning debates most of the time just loses you friends. Jesus was trying to get his word into me so I would become like him. And I was trying to win debates. It was about pride. There were some old people who remembered, listen, we don't lose battles unless we've moved away from God. But the next idea was, well, let's just get the, let's get the Ark of the Covenant. Let's get that thing that reminds us that God has promised to be with us. The Ark of the Covenant, the covenant. God has promised. So they were focusing on what God has promised, but God had promised. How did the covenant get instituted? Abraham believed God, meaning he had faith, and he got up and he left and he followed, meaning he had a faith that obeyed. A faith that was sincere, legitimate. So because he believed in God, he followed and obeyed God. So the Jews wanted the Ark of the Covenant because of God's presence, but they had no intention at this time to keep their side of the promise, which was to believe and then to respond in obedience. A true belief, not a phony belief. They just wanted God's power. They didn't want to live under the lordship that comes when God's presence is there. So, uh, we see verse 5, uh, they, get the, the, they call and get the uh, ark and says, When all the Israelites saw the ark of the covenant of the Lord coming, their camp, their shout for joy was so loud, it made the ground shake. Now today, we, we're so far removed from God's presence that we don't understand when people get excited about Jesus. You know how refreshing it was to be in Italy? We're in these restaurants with, with uh, 90 Ugandan pilgrims, charismatic Catholics, 
and they sing a worship song before they pray before their meals. So we're in a restaurant, and all of a sudden, the most beautiful harmonies are being sung, and the whole place stops. And, you know, no one complains because they can sing well. I mean, it was incredible. I'm like, oh, wow, can you imagine? I mean, I don't, I bow, I, I bless my food when I go out to eat or at home because I realize the people who made my food can bring me blessing or cursing, and I need to bless my food. I don't know where it came from. So I, out of self-protection, I bless my food. But I, man, I tell you what, to be with people who worship. And then at the end of the meal, they sing another one. And the people in the restaurants, these are obviously big restaurants because we were not the only people. Man, they were waiting for, man, I mean, the people were there a couple days, they were waiting for the next night to hear because it was so heavenly to hear these people with a sincere heart sing together and worship God at the end of the meal as well. But they were a whole hog and it came through. They were excited and are excited. You know, sometimes as Anglicans, we're kind of like, oh, let's don't get too excited. I remember I had a guy when I was a young priest told me I was too sincere. Let me tell you something. I, I can tell you now at 51, you can't be too sincere. You could be naive, but you can't be too sincere. If Father Carter or Father Don or the other people that lead our church, if they weren't absolutely sincere, we wouldn't want them. But sincerity is not enough. We must be sincere and we must be growing and committing ourselves to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our being. It's not enough to be only sincere. It, it, we want to be enthusiastic, but it's not enough to only be. You can shout because of God's presence in the ark and still be living full of sin. That's what happened here. But we're living in a day that we're not, we don't even have enough sense to shout on Sunday. You know, some people that go to church, they shout on Sunday and they do whatever they want on Monday. We don't even shout on Sunday. So we get, oh yeah, we're not like those crazy Pentecostals. They get carried away. We don't have to shout, but I tell you something. The way we read the prayers, the way we sing the songs, we may not sing as good as the Ugandans, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if we're going to get there in this life. But I tell you something, there should be something about the way we worship, the way we sing, the way we pray, the way we serve one another, the way we prepare before we ever get here. There should be something about the way we do it that it is clear that we're absolutely committed to being like Jesus. Not proudful and religious, because anybody who's really alive knows how hard it is to follow Jesus in this world and how imperfect and weak we are. We are people who need forgiveness every day. We don't want to be proud religious people telling other people, they're, listen, we're not anti-anybody. We're just pro-Jesus. And pro-Jesus does have some things of which we, we don't agree with. But we don't have to waste our time being anti-something. We need to spend our time exalting Lord Jesus Christ and following him together. That's what this thing is about. The Philistines, sadly, respected God more than the Israelites did. I mean, they had a shout in Israel, but they didn't really respect the God that they were shouting about. Verse 6 What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all that shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. Why? Because they knew that the gods or the God of Israel was the one who had sent the plagues and defeated Egypt. And they knew that Egypt was way more powerful than they were. They had a respect for the God or gods. They were polytheists. They thought it was gods. They had a respect for the deity of Israel when Israel didn't have a respect for its own deity. The gods are coming to their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We've never had a face in like this before. Verse 8, help, who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptian with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. 9, fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we'll become the Hebrew slave just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. Let me tell you something. They fought their best, but you know the reason they won? is because God was not with Israel. I mean, Israel wasn't stronger, better, smarter. The reason Israel did the great things they did is because God was honored and present with them. Listen, the church is a, is a joke in this country in so many ways. Not everywhere at all times, but in many ways. Because we're not living for God. I mean, the conservatives, we tell everybody that they're doing things wrong. 
The liberals, they say nothing you do is wrong. God's looking for some people that know what is right and walk with the humility and grace to follow Jesus and have him really make us what we talk about. We're not looking for people who just have the platitudes, they owe this and we're anti this and anti. Listen, years ago, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed, I am embarrassed to tell you, but I used to, uh, I've been here 21 years. When I was a young man here, I remember telling a joke about homosexuals. It wasn't a particularly crude or rude, but, but I remember saying a joke. And the Lord spoke to me. I'll, I'll be honest with you too, if you know me, you'll know how true this is. I was on my way to Wendy's. I, I was teaching at Santa Fe, and I was on my way to Wendy's, and I said some joke, and some of the car, but the Lord spoke to me and said, don't you ever say a joke like that in the future. He said, I am going to heal and restore homosexuals. And he said, listen, until you walk in the room to help them, the last thing you have any business doing is making fun of somebody. I, I mean, I knew I mean, there, the, the Holy Spirit was going to teach me one day to love and to help people and to tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of God was going to come to change and transform people. And here I was ridiculing them. Listen, we're not helping people because we're not whole hog. We can have our doctrine right. We can have our theology right. We can see, we call it spitting in West Virginia. You know, when it just begins to run, we call it spitting. And we, 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 we've got some spitting going on. The, the Holy Spirit is moving. But there is something which happens when the people of God get serious about following God not, the, not religious, not phony baloney, not anti-everybody, not a big Bible beating people, but people who say, I'm going to make it my business to love this world and to love Jesus the way the Bible says. And when that starts happening, when love starts being the thing that controls things, this whole world begins to change. This is what we're after. Today, when people are mentally ill, we have to send them to psychiatrists. Do you know that there is times in this country, in other places in the world, where the psychiatrists send people to the Christians? And I'm not anti-psychiatrist. I think it's great. I thank God for psychiatrists. I thank God for doctors. God can use whatever instrumental means he needs and he wants to use, whether it's medicine or anything else. I praise God for all that. But today, we have church that are absolutely powerless if we don't recognize this is not just long ago, we're living in the, our expectations are often so low. We're not even expecting God to show up anymore. We are content, just sort of plodding along. And God's saying, I'm inviting you in. There's more. There's more. Come, come. There's more. I have it for you. I have everything you need. I've got my spirit to transform you in the likeness of Jesus Christ. If you'll start hungering for me, if you'll make the choice to choose to give me preeminence in your life, I'll do the powerful things that have to be done for that to, be, to take place. We can't change ourselves, but we can say, this is what we want, this is what God's word says, so God, if you can do it, I'm here and I'm game. And then everything in our life begins to take second place in the pursuit of living and loving like Jesus. 10, the Philistines fought desperately, Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great, 30,000. Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. Th 11. The ark of, the, of God was captured in Hophni and Phinehas. The corrupt religious leaders, uh, the two sons of Eli, were killed. Jump down to verse 17. Eli, the high priest, is waiting for word of the battle, what's happened. Uh, and here's what he hears from the guy, the messenger. Israel has been defeated by the Philistines, the messenger replied. The people have been slaughtered, and your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, were also killed. The ark of God has been captured. When the, messer, when the messenger mentioned what had happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backward. Maybe he had a heart attack or a stroke. We don't know. But at the weight of that word, he fell back, broke his neck, and he died. He had been the judge. He had been the savior. Judge is like a... The, the hero that God uses for a generation. Eli, as a high priest, had been that guy. Samuel was not a high priest. Okay? But Samuel was the judge for the next generation. Listen, we are seeing in mainline churches, all, we are seeing God's judgment 
We are seeing the Holy Spirit leaving denominations. God is looking for some people that are serious about God. He's not looking for a bunch of religious people, though. Not for judgmental people. He's not looking for caricature Christians. He's not looking for what it looked like. He's looking for people that are absolutely committed to him and willing to love this world that he died for. Our motto would be, come as you are, don't stay as you are. 19, Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near her time of delivery. When she heard that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband was dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She dialed, dialed, she died in childbirth. But before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You've got a baby boy. Remember, in the ancient world, boys were more valuable. They carried on, they provided financially, all these other things. So that was supposed to be this great thing. You have a baby boy. But she did not answer or pay attention to them. She couldn't be consoled because she understood what had happened. Notice this. She named the child Ichabod. Now, some of you know Ichabod Crane. I hate to say it. Some of us, we, we've spent more time with movies and Dickens than we have with uh, the Bible to know that Ichabod, this is the glory has departed, or where is the glory? Listen, we must know. It's not just bad that the church is so impotent, messed up today in this world and in this country and, and in this city and, and here. It, that's not just bad. There is a time in which God says, my glory, my presence will depart. Ichabod. It is the statement of judgment and the departing of God. We are contending and fighting for the restoration of the presence of God in his people in this generation. We're not the only church. There's a lot of good churches around town who are doing the same thing. They are contending in their place and in their way that the presence of God would not depart, but the Holy Spirit would come back. So that the church of God would live as the people of God and the people who are broken and hurting around us would experience salvation and love and follow Jesus Christ. The church would not be a laughing stock, but, but something that would cause panic in the people that hate Jesus because they know those Christians they love. Those Christians they love. They're committed. See, what's going to happen when, when, when the church are the ones who learn how to deal with the racial stuff properly? To love and respect Jesus and to learn to love and walk together. When the church begins to do that, and we haven't done that perfectly by any means, what's going to happen when we learn uh, to be better? Sit? When, when we together as a people that become such a shining example that everyone's going to say, wow, they're the ones that are showing the path forward. She named the child Ichabod, 21, which means where is the glory? Or the glory has departed. His presence, his glory, he is no longer with. We are seeing this happening all over. For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named him because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and her husband were dead. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Turn the page. Notice at the very bottom, I, I got two pages, so instead of front and back. Some people still remember enough to know to seek God's help in times of trouble, when it's finances, these little things. But they're looking for Jesus' Savior, not Jesus' Lord. And you cannot separate the one who is the Savior from also being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, he wants to help us out. Listen, do you know how I got serious about Jesus? I was in bad shape. I had some problems. I had an issue uh, with not being able to find the woman that I love. I had all the, uh, it was those little things, quote unquote, that drove me into Jesus. But when I got there, I understood. He, and he showed me. I mean, I remember saying, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll go wherever you want to go. Say whatever you want to say. Do you know how many times I reneged on the deal? You know what the Lord said to me? Remember what you told me when you were 20? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I said anything, anywhere, anytime, whatever you want. I said that. He uses our needs to reveal his great love. That's okay. 
Don't be embarrassed asking for the sickness. Just when he heals you, when he helps you, realize it's not just about what he can do for us. In light of the one who has the power to do those things, it is only right that we would worship and follow him as Savior and Lord. Almost everybody comes to God in a place of great need. Nothing wrong with that. Unless we just become users and do not respond reasonably to the one who is so gracious and willing to help us. But I tell you something, the bottom, here's the last thing I want to say, and it's this thing from Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. Because there's a bunch of concern. I consider myself a conservative. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking about the Bible, theology. There is a problem in the conservatives that we must recognize. Those of us who love the Bible, who believe it, we're not exempt for these problems, and we have an equal and opposite problem. And, and I want you to notice this right here. Because we are living in a day where we must contest to restore the presence and power and the love of the Holy Spirit back into the church. We got people who are so used to getting whooped and to be powerless, so used to have the church having no real influence on their lives, that they got great theology, it's all great on paper, but their marriages, their interior lives, their addictions, their problems, they got nothing. But know this, quoting 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, that in the last days, perilous times were come. We live in perilous times. You can could, you could make the case that every age is perilous. Okay, but it's, we certainly know ours are. The, the nice thing about TV and everything, we hear about all the troubles. I mean, I, you know, we saw this thing about the four guys who videotaped the disabled man drowning. That's pretty rough. I can't imagine. But I'm going to tell you something. I think to myself... What kind of culture produces for guys who do that? They didn't happen in a vacuum. And we got to look at ourselves. And the church got to ask the question, how could we be acting properly as salt and light and not have a greater influence in our culture and civilization that we would not be seeing it? There was a day when God's people who are living God's ways, you wouldn't see this kind of stuff. Not that everyone's going to be a Christian, but the church can have such an influence in the culture that it restrains evil in many ways. We are seeing unrestrained evil. For men will be lovers of themselves. This is, by the way, Paul's talking about in the church, just so you know. There's always this in the world. He's saying, this is how you know how perilous a time is, because you're going to see this in the church. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We're not talking about just normal stuff. We're talking about default rebellion. Okay? I say that because there's no perfect children. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous. What's the difference in slander and gossip? Gossip is saying truth that should not be spoken. Love would never, there are many things which are true that simply should not be spoken. That's gossip. Slander is when it's a half-truth or untruth. Slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And here's the kicker. How does that happen? How do people get that far off the track amongst people who claim to be Christian? This is it. They live without the power of the Spirit. Look what it says. Having a form of godliness. Oh, they got a good liturgy. They know how to fold their hands. They can afford a good organist. All kinds of different things. Good praise and worship, man. Whatever. If you fill in the blank. Having a form of godliness, but what? but denying its power. Why? Because when the power of God is present, the Holy Spirit is present, these sins cannot be unrestrained. Meaning it takes the Holy, Spir the Holy Spirit to help you to be holy. All of us would be all these things apart from God's restraining power and transformation with the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us. And there comes a time where God's presence is so frail in the church where we're characterized by these things. And you know what's funny? We don't even, they don't even really make us blanch. We're like, yeah. It's so odd. The shoe fits. We look around us. We see this in such a predominant way. 
So the question is, how do we respond to it? Listen, you wouldn't be at an Anglican church with a guy in robes, long sermon. You wouldn't be here if you weren't interested. I get that. But part of what it means and part of leadership is saying defining reality. We must over and over, by God's word, define reality and say we are living for a day that we are beginning to taste in which the Holy Spirit of God is worshipped and loved by God's people. Not perfect people. We all got issues, all got problems. I eat too much. I, I, I mean, I, I got too many. I got all kinds of things that I'm asking you to help me and I'm struggling. I don't have it all together. But we must know this is the course. This is where we're going. And we are seeking God to pour out his spirit to give us the power to be what God requires. And God's word says when his people begin to do that, the Holy Spirit gets poured out and people get transformed. That's what we want. We see people here. We see his spirit coming. But not like his spirit can come. And not like I have seen his spirit even in other places in my own lifetime. If we understand, we have lowered our expectations, but we need to get them back and say, wait a minute, you mean God could help us and do these things, and it wouldn't just mean that we're super religious and turn everybody off? Yeah, yeah, believe it or not, when the Holy Spirit comes, people are not obnoxious and a pain in the neck, at least not the Christian good people. The mature people aren't. You can always have all kinds of people. I remember at Oxford, they had that revival in London, Holy Trinity Brompton. You've heard of Alpha and all that came out of that church. Susan and I were at Oxford. We had a people that were from the praise and worship band from Holy Trinity Church of England. Major revival went to all the world. They smiled all the time. They were not obnoxious. They weren't phony. They drove me crazy. I'm like, who are these people smiling all the time? They could not, well, they, beg, they begged me. They tried to take me. I, you, they couldn't get me to go. I would go to London to eat at Harrods for the buffet. And I did on numerous occasions. I'd go all the way, 45 minutes on a bus, just to get to go for a good meal, take Susie. But you couldn't get me to go there. And the people unnerved me, but they were not phony, and they weren't jerks, and they weren't obnoxious. I just did not understand what the Holy Spirit, what love looked like. So much so, I've been ready with so much dead religion that when the Holy Spirit was, got people full of love, I could not recognize what it was. I was repelled by it rather than attracted to it. That's a sad day. Listen, if we could get clear to know that God provides to give us by his spirit everything that's already been given in Jesus, manifest in our lives, to fill us with love so we can love our spouses, to forgive, all kind of stuff that we, we struggle. So there is a grace that is given by the spirit. But it doesn't happen without longing, knowing God's word, and seeking and asking and knocking. And then together, the people of God begin to experience this overwhelming, it's like a uh, when you read about revival in books, it's like an avalanche. It's like all of a sudden, the, the avalanche comes and he just carries people and transforms them. That's the kind of grace that we're looking for. Nothing less will do. Nothing less will do. And we will not be people who have all the right theology, smile on Sundays, but our marriages, are, everything else is catastrophe, but we pretend all is well. We're not going to be those people. And we're not going to say, well, everything's falling apart, so we're going to say everything's game because we feel too guilty saying that there's any problems. No, we're going to live in the tension saying, listen, this is what God is. This is what God requires. We're not there. That's why we come for forgiveness. Every, every service, you will hear a big, long repentance because we recognize we're the people who need to, to be forgiven and to repent of our sins. We're the people that must live in love and charity, and we haven't done it properly. So we commit ourselves weekly, uh, bi-weekly, different services, we commit ourselves to this end. Because if we can pursue him, he is waiting to bless us at the right time. He is going to overwhelm, him, overwhelm us with his goodness. But this is something that we are being called to experience as a family, that we cannot experience in this kind of fullness, not a fullness that changes a city or a state. It doesn't happen just through one person having devotions. It happens when the people of God come together as a family and say, this is what we're after. Some are further along the path. Others are just beginning. It doesn't matter. But when people start saying, this is where I'm going, Jesus and, and, and learning to live and love in this world like him, that's what I'm after. When that starts characterizing us, there'll still be sin. 
There'll still be things to repent of. But when that commitment to him starts moving, the Holy Spirit starts pouring out the grace and the love and the strength and the power we need. And then we can be a blessing to the nations. The day will come when people say, oh, we don't want to be Christians, but boy, do we need them in our society. We got to have them. If, if they're not here, who's going to take care of the people? Who's going to do that? Because the Christians are the ones that have the heart of Jesus. They're the ones that are reacting to the issue. What would we do without the Christians? Do you know that in many times in Western Europe, that's what happened? In Africa, when you go to country, that, that if it weren't for the Christians, they couldn't hold together? Why not us? Why not us? We're not going to people who are going to have a form of godliness without the power. And the way to ensure that is we commit ourselves afresh and new to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and as Lord of all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we love you, and yet our love is an imperfect love, and my love is an imperfect love, Lord. But Lord, this morning we come and we just recognize that what you've called us to, we are not. And we recognize without your grace and help and without hearty repentance and, and true faith, we cannot expect you to hear us and to help us. Lord, we pray for the grace to truly hate the things you hate, the sins in our lives. Lord, we ask for your grace to truly love the things that are good. That we wouldn't be people characterized by selfishness and uh, being self-consumed and, and narcissistic, but, but Lord, that we would be a people who absolutely, our hearts are so full of the love of Jesus that whether it be homeless, whether it be mentally ill, whether it be the elderly, whether it be children, that we're absolutely involved in every level in the needs and the problems around us. Lord, that your church would be a place where there's there's an exaltation of Jesus, and our politics don't divide us. Lord, we need help. And Lord, this is the family you planted us in, and so together we say yes. Give us a hunger and a thirst, because you say that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. So Lord, we are not afraid of the, the emptiness within us. Lord, we pray for the grace to be empty, that the hunger would come and that your spirit would come out and fill us up. Lord, we need love. We need your power. Lord, teach us, help us, strengthen us as we live in this world together. Lord, we love you and we, we bless you in the meantime. And yet, Lord, we know there's more. There's more for us. So we ask for it in the most wonderful and the most precious name, the name of Jesus. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven.